Um, do you do many of these kind of things where you sit down and I, talk to people? I Publicly? started to maybe I've done like two of these previously um, for radio shows. Yeah. Do you enjoy them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I um, I think I started with when I did Grand Rounds um, at my work on critical race theory. Yeah. Um, and I'm not canceled. So I still have a job. And so like that encouraged me to to do more and be more public. Um, I think that maybe the tide is turning or maybe it's um, there is more goodwill in the world and we don't need to black pill so much that because the my grand rounds on the ethical uh, catastrophe that is critical race theory was very well received by uh, people in real life. It's not Twitter. Mm-hmm. And by people in real life, you mean people with co-workers, co-workers, a specific industry. So, what industry, yeah. if if you don't mind specifying? Oh, I'm I'm a doctor. I'm a hospital based pediatrician. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. And uh, what's your client load? I don't know if that really matters or not, but like per year, Cli- do you- oh, I, I have no idea per year, but on yeah. a daily basis when I go to work. So I'm a hospital based doctor. And um, the way that works is that you, uh, you know, there, there are two or three doctors on at a time during a day shift, but I also do night shifts and weekends as well. So all of those different types of shifts are a little bit different. Um, but during a typical day shift, I probably see ten pa- about approximately ten patients because they're they're hospitalized, so they're issue. I mean, they're definitely sick, and then they have uh, more yeah. complex issues than like your well child checks in the clinic. Oh, okay. So, so like on an outside, like a pediatrician in a clinic may see in some places like forty patients a day, which is I think insane, or fifty or sixty, depending on. Um, how much help they have with writing notes. So 10 sounds like a really uh, low number, but the problems they have are more complex. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been a pediatrician? Um, I I graduated medical school in 2012. Okay. And then I've been training between 2012 and 2015 and then in practice ever after. And and being a hospital-based pediatrician is the only type of work I've done, but I've done that in different locations. And how has the industry changed? Has it changed significantly over the last uh, decade, I guess, since you've been working in it? Uh, The kind of the day-to-day operations has not changed that much. Um, But I I mean, even in my personal experience, it's hard to perceive large changes. If you talk to um, old timers, they would tell you that it's changed a lot since they've been around because mm-hmm. hospital medicine is is a relatively young uh, subspecialty. In fact, it's not at all a subspecialty. I never went to fellowship. So I'm a, I, I'm a generalist and I identify as a, as a generalist, not a subspecialist. But um, pediatric hospital medicine has now um, been categorized as a subspecialty. And I'm actually going to take an exam in November to be able to grandfather in as a subspecialist, even though um, other people who are graduating medical school today would not have that option open to them. And they will have to do a fellowship after okay. residency. Yeah. And how do they define pediatric as opposed to just general hospital medicine? Is there something special about children um, that you have to be keyed into? Oh, I mean, you train as a pediatrician. uh, So the residence you go to is in in general pediatrics. um, And then you learn about children's diseases. I mean, you can be an adult hospitalist, but you only deal with adults and and not children. So it's, it's mutually exclusive. You, there are some, some subset of people who are trained in these, residency called combined medicine pediatrics combined residencies it's four years instead of three and they do both adults and children and they're 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 literally cradle to grave kind of care including you know having experience with premature babies born at 24 weeks of gestation all the way to your like 99 year old grandma 
maybe a hundred over a hundred. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And are, so are you have a deeper knowledge specifically about diseases that affect children? Absolutely. As to somebody. Okay. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, I mean, that's the only thing I know, right? Okay. I don't, I don't know anything about adult medicine. Oh, okay. But I, I'm just, uh, how is it different? How are kids different than adults just biologically? Is there oh, like a key difference? Yeah. Well, I, I would go back. I know and it should that. be obvious, but yeah. Oh, I will correct that. It's not like I don't know anything about adults, right? I know, I know, I, I've still been to medical school and learned a little about adults, but I never worked um, profession. Like I, my residency didn't have any adult um, training in it. Um, but children uh, generally are more resilient. Uh, the, it's a healthier population for sure. And even when they hosp- get hospitalized, generally kids have like one problem um, as opposed to like 10 with adults who get hospitalized. And uh, what I found was that uh, parents usually know their children's medical history better than adults know about themselves. So that is one of the um, things that are attractive about the field for me, because mm-hmm. one of the most important tools to a doctor is that conversation with whoever's providing the medical history. Mm-hmm. And then I guess, well, the, the human body goes this way towards health. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, in life, it develops this way and then it starts mm-hmm. to deteriorate and there's a lot yeah. of problems on the deterioration side. Yeah. And there's probably yeah. specific problems that occur here and then probably things that are shared. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're an outpatient pediatrician, then then most of your um, patients are going to be healthy. But as a hospital based pediatrician, I what I see a lot are are children with chronic illnesses, especially like severely disabled children, some of whom are actually neurologically devastated and technology dependent to live. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is, I guess, it's hard to compare that with like, I don't know, a 50 year old adult who's otherwise like fairly functional, but might have some heart problems and kidney problems, stuff mm-hmm. like that. that. That's quite different because a lot of the kids I take care of have, um, they cannot feed by mouth. So they need a tube and you infuse formula into their digestive tract, or they have like other devices of medical, um, implants in them, like a central line or, um, in some cases, like in my current job, I don't deal with this a lot, but some children are, have a trach uh, in order to keep their airway open to breathe, or maybe they might even be ventilator dependent. So that that's um, a big portion of what a hospital-based pediatrician deals with. And then a lot of the devices can malfunction. Like if you have a shunt and uh, I don't know, any kind of tubes, they're prone to infections and clogging and all that kind of stuff. So that that's one subpopulation. Um, and then the other ones would be fairly functional children with chronic illnesses like diabetes and Crohn's disease, uh, different arthritis and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, asthma, stuff like that. Or that, they that, get in an accident and they need rehabilitation too? Is that um, I don't do any rehab because acute hospital mm-hmm. medicine is different from like rehabilitative. They go to a different institute. Okay. next door yeah oh, okay. yeah and i used to take care of like surgical uh patients as well like co managed with surgeons um unfortunately believe it or not like when i was in la I, I worked at county the la county hospital and one of my bread and butter was gunshot wounds in adolescence really yeah okay yeah that's cultural yeah i don't deal with that at all uh where i currently work so yeah so, and how did you get into medicine? Do you come from a long line of doctors? Not at all. I, I'm first. the only one. I'm, I think my mom uh, had this idea that I should be a doctor because I'm Asian. And uh, <laughs> play, I play piano. I, you know, <laughs> I got married and had kids and I went into medical school. It's like a very stereotypical Asian, Asian mm-hmm. thing. I think she's pretty happy with that. Um, I, I don't regret it. I think it's ultimately... Um, you know, in college, I, I kind of um, played around with the idea of saving the planet and becoming a conservation biologist or something like that. And then I realized I really didn't have a plan for, for a career. And I just met, um, met some people that are 
whose personality is, uh, shall we say, like uh, more lively than a typical pre-med that I, I would meet. I mean, that just that makes a lot of difference, like the people you meet. Okay. Wait, in, in pre-med, you got connected with a raucous co- cohort? Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, pre-meds are, were not my favorite people to hang out when I was in college. Okay. Just because there, there are certain stereotypes about them being like gunners and um, always they all they have their pre-med course load and they all, all have to like complete it. It's kind of, it just seemed kind of boring. And the mm. half of people who uh, start out as pre-meds as freshmen in college uh, quit. Mm. Um, so, um, but I, uh, when I didn't have a plan, I went on a summer exploratory kind of internship type of thing and met a urologist of all subspecialists. Mm. His, his specialty of all things is like male fertility. Oh. But, uh, there's like, He's got a great personality and I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, doctors are not all just boring and intellectually uncurious. So hmm. that broke through the stereotype and I've, I've been very happy to have gone into medicine. Oh, cool. And you are first generation American. Your parents are immigrants. I'm an so, immigrant. I'm an immigrant. Oh, yeah. Okay. When, when did you land on the shores of America? Uh, when I was 10. Okay. In 1993. In 1993. And what was going yeah. on in your country of origin that instigated you, your family moving? At that moment, not a whole lot, because it takes a very long time to get through the immigration process. But um, my, my parents uh, survived the Cultural Revolution. And um, I suppose I could talk a little bit about that. So, yeah, would you tell yeah. us stories about that? Because it seems to have uh, caught on here um, somewhat. I mean, mm-hmm. it's pretty chill right now in America. I've been in 2020 and before then. There was mm-hmm. evidence of some sort of cultural revolution. Right now, it's just working uh, through media. Not right now, it's the, the law march through the institutions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, because the, the bloody kind of revolution as the type that we saw in China... Um, doesn't tend to win hearts. Um, so the Great Chinese Cultural Revolution um, happened between 1967 and 1966, 60, like the mid to late 60s, um, and lasted about 10 years. And by that time, China had already been through a Sino, like a Japanese, Sino-Japanese war, which was brutal. Um, that last that one was eight years and then it had also been through like further back it had, had been through like opium war and all the uh european uh influence yeah. yeah and then there was also a civil war and then there was the great leap great leap forward um which was characterized by lysenkoism and the starvation of millions of people so by the time that the cultural revolution started there were already all of this trauma and um, uh, just catastrophic levels of poverty and uh, social and cultural problems. So I think uh, it's, you know, there there is like the alignment of the ideological and the psychological on a Mm -hmm. massive scale. Um, During the Cultural Revolution, the um, people were divided into black and red categories and both of my parents came from black categories uh, because their fathers, both my maternal and paternal grandfathers were Christian ministers. And um, that is considered to be in alignment of a Western colonial set of values and, and religion. Um, and and uh, when you have a revolution, you want to really crack down on old institutions such as religion especially when you can peg it as foreign and Western. Um, and so, capitalist. And ca- Well, sure. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, why, my, why black versus red? What was the significance of black? Do you know? Uh, I, I guess black is I, associated with being bad. Okay. Yeah. Uh, red, of course, is the color of um, revolution and, and yeah. communism. And utopia. Um, 
Uh, black might also be associated with the the Chinese Nationalist Party. I, I, I'm not sure okay. if that that was the intention, because obviously people were placed into the black categories were not all of the rival party. Mm -hmm. um, but the the people that were categorized as black were like landlords, uh, rich farmers, um, capitalist intellectuals. There, there were nine black categories. I mean, it started with five, but then expanded to nine. Oh, and some wow. in in some of it, it like included traders and and the, my favorite is bad influence, bad influencers like white fans, just like bad people. <laughs> so it makes me just, Im okay. imagine like some Instagram model, that, <laughs> like a bad influencer. <laughs> that's what that's that's one of. I mean, like who could possibly fight a label? like that right like it's yeah. it's just so vague and perhaps intentionally so um but intellectuals it's like pretty easy my, my family pretty easily fit that fit that mold and um, how old were your parents at this time during the they were teenagers they were okay. teenagers and then my mom um like all the schools got canceled um and there were uh red guards who were actively uh struggling like initiating struggle sessions upon their own parents, grandparents to signal their red status. Because mm -hmm. it's like, it's a witch hunt. Like if people are not considered sufficiently revolutionary, then they can get struggle sessions against them. So yeah. if you s initiate struggle sessions upon somebody else, maybe the witch hunt won't come to you. And my mom, um, of course, like she, she had friends as teenagers all do. And not everybody knew about her family's background. So she, she told me stories about having been invited to uh, to joining like a, a group of regards to to go invade homes. And like the, the moral choice at that time is like very difficult because if you don't join in, maybe they'll come to your house. I, I don't, she, she's I, she's not joined as far as I know. In, in participating in these kind of like home invasions. But basically struggle sessions are often involving the Red Guards coming forcefully into homes and dragging the inhabitants into the street to, okay. to um, yell abuse at them, to throw rocks at them, to humiliate them publicly and to ransack their houses. Yeah. And Mao empowered that generation, your parents' generation. A lot of the Red Guard, from what I understand, mm -hmm. was the youth at that time yeah and yeah. It, was it do you think was it that they were categorized as so-called black that prevented them from um you know embracing the red guard hood or what kind of personality uh, character do you have to have to be in the middle of that and not get swept up in it Oh, yeah, I think they, they were categorized as black. That is part of it. But also, like, as victims of this kind of violence themselves. Um, and as Christians, I think all of that played a role of them not becoming red guards. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did have your parents told you any stories about what it's like specifically to be a Christian during that period of time? Like, how would they meet or how would they have community? Uh, yes, I think that um, the the gracious thing about this conflict is realizing that even under extreme and stark circumstances, if you have a close community of friends, they literally can save your life. So um, there um, there have been a lot of help. I mean, my maternal grandfather was killed, um, and and I heard the story from my aunt, my mom's younger. Uh, at the time, but my gra my maternal grandfather was arrested by secret police um, after he preached a sermon that talked about brotherhood of man. That, that was deemed counter-revolutionary, and they think that there had been secret police that were watching these kind of church activities. And so he was arrested, um, imprisoned without a charge, and eventually just he, he just died. He was like in his 40s, he was previously healthy. Do you know um, how long he was imprisoned? About a year. Oh, wow. Um, if yeah. he was in his 40s, that must have been pretty harsh conditions. Yeah. To... And do you know if yeah. he was forced to, to make an apology or to send some, some, some sort of document? I've heard I, that, I don't know. that was being I, practiced at that time. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. But, but it was pretty common to force apologies 
to um, denounce yourself. Um, that's part. I mean, Ch the Chinese are the ones who um, perfected the techniques of brainwashing, and they do it incrementally. I actually learned about this from not from necessarily from my parents, but from from other people. Uh, from like books or from people from China that oh that actually from China. from people who are privy to what's going on what was going on in China I think I learned about it from Brett Brett Weinstein about how how brainwashing techniques work mm -hmm. no, yeah my parents were not subject subject to it so they they don't have first hand account for me mm -hmm. uh, regarding regarding that but but like the entire society was um just immersed in brainwashing like the, all all music and all art was banned except eight model operas that mao's wife approved hmm. and, and and that's the only entertainment that people are allowed to have but um, was it controlled who could perform it did, did, were there troops that could perform yes. it in different areas or something like yeah that? yeah yeah hmm. and then um if you own the piano or piano sheet or just a bust of Beethoven, uh, and if those were for, uh, found in those Red Gar home invasions, then that could be grounds for a struggle session. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, there, there, there had been entire orchestras that committed mass suicide um, because, because of this kind of stuff. Oh, geez. Yeah, just like okay. the previously uh, music um, uh, professionals, right, that trained in, in playing classical music. And they just all killed themselves. Oh, God. Well, I mean, one can imagine the amount of stress that you'd mm -hmm. have to go through, um, especially as a community, to mm -hmm. do that all together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I don't know if they had a suicide pact and they all killed it. You know, they just, okay. it were just like individuals in the orchestra killed themselves. And, but mm -hmm. that, that was like a disproportional number from like a particular group that would mm -hmm. have a much higher risk of suicide compared to 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 other compared to farmers for example yeah, yeah. what are some of the stories or a story that your father's told you about that period of time my Maybe father more. uh his father uh was also a christian minister um he because he was from a black category he had no chance of getting into college um and then in terms of marital uh aspect marital prospects those are also se um, severely limited for people from black categories because if you associate with black category people you would see a fall in your social status mm -hmm. yeah but somehow your mom and dad found each other Is my that... mom i mean their families oh. were were friends and okay. uh from you know they have church um associations i suppose so their, okay. their families knew each other mm -hmm. now, i mean that's pretty much the only way you can find find a mate if you're from a black category you can mm -hmm. find other black category people network and so the cultural revolution lasts 10 years which is a very long time for this amount of stress to be going on and you well said i mean the the, the peak parts. of it the peak of it probably happened within the first two or three years Okay. Um, and then they had a long tail. Pretty, what, pretty much, it ended when Mao died. Oh, okay. So that yeah. that's how it petered out. Yeah. Was and then and then there were a lot of blame to go around, and his wife was sentenced to death, and she got a lot of the blame for her role in the in the Cultural Revolution. I mean, like at the end, a lot of it was just using ideology as a um, a excuse or cudgel for factional uh, power struggles. Mm -hmm. So, so um, in a way, it kind of reifies this I idea that the whole world is made of power structures. And then, and then the ideology is then used to, to actually um, create power structures. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and people, very vicious power structures, too, that mm -hmm, don't have any room yeah. for other forms or other views of power other than gaining it and keeping uh -huh. it. And so your parents survived, and Mao, uh, the the pressure kind of is taken off. How did your mom and dad eventually get to college or or find a? Career? They they never went to college. They, okay. they, they neither of them have been to college. What um, then they up doing? 
did they end up doing? Uh, my father was a, uh, of all things, English teacher. I mean, he, his English speaking skills is, is not great, but in, in China, like a lot of the middle school, he taught middle school, a lot of English teachers, they just taught English grammar as opposed yeah. to how to speak English. Um, so, so that he was, I mean, he was um, part of a program called Up the Mountain, Down the Village, uh, which is a forceful separation of young people away from their families if you're urban um, and sent away to uh, rural areas to learn from the farmers. Okay. Um, so he was part of that and he spent a lot of time in rural China uh, doing teaching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he, from that, he told me some stories about how he was lucky to have avoided because he, he was um, partially educated and was um, uh, assigned to be a teacher as opposed to go actually into the field to do farming. Because uh, at that time, China's farming technology was not that um, mechanized and, um, and people like for actual rural farmers went into the rice fields to plant rice. Um, and that's where there, there's a parasite called Chinese liver fluke. And he knew a lot of people who got infected with Chinese liver fluke, which is a really nasty parasitic infection. And oh. he was, he was lucky to not have contracted Chinese liver fluke. And it, it uh, enters through the foot and it, uh, in, in wet, like rice fields. And it get, gets lodged in the liver. Is it a bacteria yeah. or something? No, it's a it's a parasite. It's a it's okay. a parasite. Oh, it is a eukaryotic nasty parasite. Okay. And uh, what what's the uh, general treatment for that? Oh, I'm gonna embarrass myself. I've never seen okay. a case. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thankfully, because it's not it's not parasitic infections is just not a, that much of a thing here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, it seems to only be endemic to, to China for the, it's called Chinese liver fluke for a, for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm sure I can find a textbook that I had. We it was just spend some time. Yeah, but, question. but he was, he was telling me about how he just knew people who had that infection and, uh, had really severe, like it damages a lot of organs. Yeah. And so Mao's doing like these he's just ordering it's very totalitarian he's just ordering people to go yeah. here and go there and yeah. keeps keeping everybody keeping the country destabilized it seems like but, very destabilized like ripping young people away from their families and forcing them to go go to places um and then my mom recently told me about a tv show that depicted some of this where some urban young women had were sent to rural areas and had to basically have survival sex in order to kind of get through it I mean, that's another way to, to try to get a little bit of power. Um, yeah. Yeah. And how long did that last? Did, did your parents like eventually settle down and find a place? And Yeah. I mean, they, they got married, but they were living um, apart for a while because of the hukou system, which is like an internal passport. So because my father was based in rural southern China and my mom was based in Shanghai, they were my father was not allowed to internally immigrate to Shanghai. It's, it's a really weird, I mean, it's a t intentionally totalitarian system. Uh, Is it for they, population they, control or just for psychological? Control? Oh, uh, I think it, there's a purpose of um, economic purpose of trying to uh, ensure that the population doesn't all move to urban areas. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they want to keep it spread out. Yeah. And then ensure that there are some, like some educated people in the rural areas to function there. Yeah. 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 I, I listened to a podcast a few days ago um, mm -hmm. and I don't know where my phone is, so I can't look it up quickly, but it, a guy was talking about China and that it's basically on the edge of collapse right now. He was making a case for mm. it being uh, about to collapse because the way that it, it's been set up and um, the way that it, its economy has been running and then the, mm. uh, so the, mm -hmm. the population collapsed too. And then he was saying some pretty dire stuff about it's uh, China's future inability and he says within the next 10 years there's going to be nobody left who knows how to farm anymore there because the way that 
the government has kind of been arranging people constantly. Like there's this wealth of knowledge of how to farm that's basically gone. And that's basically what they're going to have to do in a post-globalist society mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when China is no longer relied upon, if it is the case that China is no longer relied upon by uh, the Western countries to make the things mm. that we want from it. Yeah. I mean, I think there are similar problems here, too, that like not that many people are experienced at farming. Yeah. Or even it, industry. Because uh, traditionally it's like a family business, but now like you kind of need large families to all help out and yeah. trans transfer that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So the seventies happens, Mao dies, the eighties happen. And how I did was your born parents... in the eighties. I okay. was born in the eighties. And that's an interesting story because I'm the second child after the institution of a one-child policy. I have an older sister, uh, but my sister was able to immigrate first without my parents at the age of four um, because my parents wanted to like get her out of the country. Uh, she was born the year the Mao died, so there's still a lot of residual um, revolution. And my parents decided that that uh, when she's four, sent her over to the United States with grandma. Okay. Was your grandma already there? My grandma was uh, immigrating at the time. I had an uncle that came here first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so your sister left and you were born? In yeah, I, I was born after my sister left. And okay. my when my mom was two months, one month or two months pregnant with me, she had to go get a rubber stamp on a piece of paper that said that the pregnancy was allowed to continue. And what's the, how, the mechanism of deciding that? Oh, that, that my sister wasn't going to come back. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you never, you didn't see your sister. I, I met my sister one time during the summer when I was four and she was 10. Um, and then I didn't see her again until I was 10 and she was 16. Okay. She, well, I'm the same age as your sister, so it's interesting. Oh, okay. To put myself in in the headspace of uh, that happening to me. Yeah. Um, and so, what was it like for you growing up? Uh, I grew up in Those Shanghai. I mean, it's pretty typical. Um, I, I, I don't think my childhood is being uh, particularly that remarkable, but I, I guess I would remark about the school, like elementary school, what that's like going to school in China. Um, cause we, cause like school indoctrination is a big top national topic right now. And I've, um, I suppose I've, uh, uh, experienced, uh, some ideological indoctrination in the, in, in elementary school, uh, from grade one through four. Um, th there's a lot of homework, uh, in first grade, I think it's a huge change from, uh, kin well, we didn't really have kindergarten. It, it's kind of like you are in uh, preschool and then you go to first grade when you're six. And um, there were six lectures a day of 40 minutes each uh, in a classroom with about 40 to 50 kids. Um, it's, it's literally set up like a lecture hall. Uh, and there is about two, three hours of homework. And some of that is not developmentally appropriate. Like the evidence that homework, especially at that age, helps with development and uh, gaining knowledge and conceptual understanding of different academic topics is um, is nil, right? Like their homework does not, at that age, um, when you're six or seven, homework doesn't help you learn. Uh, but part of it is to... Uh, I think keep the kids busy until the parents came came back from work. So if school ended around three, you have that extra two hours where kids are like tied up doing homework mm -hmm. until the parents could could come. And then we would be doing things like practice and penmanship. So a lot of copying Chinese characters. Um, and then every Monday morning, uh, first thing like seven thirty or eight o'clock uh, every Monday morning there will be a loudspeaker um, radio session about the country and communists and stuff. 
for 40 minutes every Monday, weekly. Um, every day there were twice daily flag ceremonies um, to, to, to uh, hoist the flag and to take it down. So twice a day uh, where you sang the national anthem and, um, and looked, at, looked at the flag. Um, and then uh, we also had group exercise uh, I think it was, was a, I can't remember, it was once a day or twice a day, but I just remember that same music being played every day oh, wow. for four years <laughs> for, yeah. for my uh, child, for, during my childhood. It's like a marching music. And it was like the same music every day. And it's the same in every school also. Yeah. It's completely uniform. And so you do your marches, you do your like group exercises. Um, and I only re learned recently that group exercise also tends to, um, to create a group cohesiveness. Like it yeah. develops identity and makes people more groupish as opposed to ind individualistic. Mm -hmm. um, there is a class called Morals and Thoughts. Uh, <laughs> first graders okay um and and a lot of it is like pretty sen commonsensical like good citizenship stuff like say thank you and apologize if you stepped on someone's toe yeah uh but that. but but then like every every now and then there will be some some good communist uh citizenship in there and then as you get older in second and third grade um you start having to wear the red scarf um, and I, I had I wore the red scarf. What did that represent then? Uh, the red scarf represents a corner of the Chinese flag. Okay. And uh, all children, it's, it would be a punishment to to take it away. It's a it's a privilege, if you will, to to wear the to wear the red, the red scarf to kind of denote that as a child you are you have you are a good citizen at school. And what are the circumstances wherein it would be taken away? Oh, if you have like behavioral problems, if you get into a fight, I don't know. If you okay. fa fail your classes, um, okay, yeah. Uh, but mathematics instruction is is uh, much better than what it is in the United States. I felt mm -hmm. like between fourth grade and ninth grade, after I, I immigrated in fifth grade, fourth grade, um, and between fourth grade and ninth grade, I felt like I didn't learn that much math, and then ninth grade. Um, I went to Lowell High School and the math was like, took off. Um, but in fourth grade in China, we were doing two, um, two unknowns, like so a word problem that will have two, two variables. And you have to do your substitution, like algebraic substitution or so to, to figure out both X and Y. So I, I don't, I don't think fourth grade, fourth graders do that here. If they're homeschooled, who knows? Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I remember that like kids just couldn't do simple long division when I moved here mm -hmm. in the in the same grade. What was it like moving here? Was it like culture shock or fun, adventurous, nerve wracking? Well, I didn't know any English, so okay. that's that's a big problem, right? So, I wait, you weren't given any kind of leg up from your dad. He he taught English. Um, he doesn't speak English. Oh, he, he just, just knows how to teaches grammar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I came here, I didn't know English and had to learn that. And of course, for a 10 year old, that creates social, social problems. And uh, was there a Chinese community that you guys moved into or were you pretty? Yeah. Isolated? I mean, San Francisco in San Francisco. Okay. And I actually went to, this is the saving grace. I mean, like there's so many problems with San Francisco United, United school district currently. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the great things they have is the um, Chinese Education Center, which is a small school that served Chinese immigrants uh, and their children. And so uh, it's only open for one year uh, for each child and then with the expectation that you're going to move out uh, to, uh, to be able to join a regular school with better English skills. So I, I went there for a year. Um, Do you feel like that was very helpful yeah absolutely yeah. i i think that school is um is a very worthy uh and very valuable resource uh in san francisco unified 
What about culturally being in San Francisco as opposed to Shanghai? Um, was there something remarkable to you about it or odd that was particularly? Yes, I would say in Shanghai, there, there, um, there are poor areas, but there weren't areas in town that are dangerous for a child to walk around alone to school. So mm-hmm. worrying about the bad part of town and safety for a child to walk alone to school is um, that that is new. That was new moving here. And it was something that had to be learned. You're in the Wild West now. Yeah. Did you take gun uh, classes or? No. Self-defense? <laughs> no. Like that? No. No, okay. no just. just a, didn't walk around at night. Yeah. 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 And uh, was your sister there? So was there a family reunion on that level, on that front? Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah. I finally reunited with my sister after 12 years of separation for, for my parents. Yeah, I was only 10 at the time. Mm-hmm. And you were, uh, how did your parents uh, take the move? So. Uh, it was really, really difficult, I think, because they were, um, they were intellectuals in China and my mom was a leader of a, um, a whole system of preschool. And then she came over here and the only job that she could do was being a, a seamstress, which still existed at the time. At that time, we still made things in the United States, of course, then all, since then, all of that has moved to Asia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But there was, you know, um, she experienced wage theft and and just not being treated fairly um, and is considered like low skill, right? Because of her limit, limit, Mm -hmm. uh, limit with English. They would have had to calculate that the trade-offs between living in America and suffering a huge reduction of cachet and ease of life and finances. What do you think drove that to that decision to move to America. Education. Education. For for the children. Like in, in what respect? It sounds um, like there's a lot of education you're already undergoing and that yeah. American oh. education was somewhat behind. Oh, I think eventually being having access I guess having a, a fairer um employment prospects and opportunities. For you, for the kids. For for, for the kids, yeah. 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 So they took the hit for you guys. Mm-hmm. And, and the, 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 there's also like, I suppose, uh, somewhat of an ideological reason in that we came here to, to embrace liberty and civil rights, which was something that they didn't have um, in China coming out of the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. So, so, so compared to what they experienced, there's more equality here in the West. And freedom. And freedom. And people are not judged based on their parents uh, or their, or, or, you know, what they call uh, which is like your elements, um, which is are basically immutable characteristics about yourself. Like there isn't limitation based on a wasn't limitation based on immutable characteristics in the, in the West. And that was a big part of why we decided to come here. Mm-hmm. Because because they were definitely limited by their immutable characteristics when they were in China, being mm-hmm. from black categories. Yeah, yeah. So you then kind of do the Gen X, or mm-hmm. maybe you're an elderly millennial or geriatric mm-hmm. millennial, whatever generation you actually are. You do that. I'm a millennial. Kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a like you're a millennial. millennial. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the 90s, you still remember the 90s and then it was great, fruitful time. Yeah. You yeah. do the 2000 dot com boom. At some point, this kind of communist ish thing called woke starts to encroach into mm-hmm. your field of view. Where's the first time that you noticed that? And did it recall things about China or did your parents point that out to you? Um, I did not personally experience the cultural revolution. So all my 
um, understanding about it is from firsthand when it's accounts, mostly my parents. Um, I, I remember, though, about when Brett Weinstein was essentially struggle sessioned against at Evergreen. And so I, I think that's how I came across you and your your work reporting on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. when you saw that, what was your reaction? It's terrifying. I, I think what, what he, I mean, I was super impressed about how he was able to keep calm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that kind of like mob justice is exactly um, the the force behind the, the, the red guards. Cause I mean, the, the red guards eventually, I think they try to ring them in, but that kind of chaos was a, a feature and not a bug during, during the, the most violent years of the revolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the co- communists try to then, then try to control, uh, take control over the, the red guards and, Generally, they did not end up well. Like they, they were gypped. Uh, they were they um, uh, they were deprived of uh, education and the Red Guard. Were yeah. The yeah, 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 yeah. The, the they Red were Guards. pretty much disposed of when they yeah. served their youth. They were just exactly. given a shovel and told to walk to this province. Yeah. Yes, not come back. Yeah, and then they also some some of them got blamed for oh you know the, these kids were acting on their own. Accord, as opposed to yeah. serving uh, the the correct version of communism. Yeah, I know that I I've watched documentaries that touch on mm-hmm. the resentment that China had um, post Red Guard toward that generation uh, mm-hmm. for their behavior. Mm-hmm. And so, did you see? Did you recognize that when you saw the stuff at Evergreen? Did you recognize ch- what had happened in China? Or was that a yeah, I think so. later on? Yeah. Yeah. And then you saw it I mean, I think, I'm not sure. At, at that time, I think it was, there were definitely psychological parallels. I think the ideological, I only understood a little later. Mm-hmm. But eventually that spread and mm-hmm. 2020 happened. What was your reaction during 2020? Or what were your parents' reaction when they saw what was happening in our country in the name of racial justice? Did that? seem to echo with the cultural revolution um i don't know if my parents uh, think that much about the parallel because of course like during the cultural revolution it wasn't a even though there are black and red categories it's different different dynamics than racial dynamics there were racial issues in china for sure but uh, that's also a separate topic. Mm-hmm. So but the, 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 the same, the, it's the same mechanism. If you just swap out uh, capitalist for racist, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm, the same mm-hmm, pattern mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of thought control. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, they were not happy with what was happening mm-hmm. and just the, the, the seeming lack of accountability for destructive behavior is very chilling. Mm-hmm. And, so you saw critical race theory come to your work place or to your uh, not so much to my workplace, which, which is why I feel privileged, if you will, to be able to talk about it. Oh, okay. My, my, my workplace is at, at least for now, quite sane about what you're allowed to, to talk about. Um, but medicine as an institution is being um, consumed by woke I think it was just last week the they ratcheted it up another level. I think American. Oh, that's been in the works for a, for a while, yeah. but but it's the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, which is in charge of all medical schools. They're they're like the credentialing body for all medical schools. So if the medical school doesn't follow the AAMC's dictates, it could lose accreditation. Mm-hmm. And the AAMC is dictating that DEI uh, is now a core competency. And they full on um, embrace critical race theory. I can read you some quotes. Yeah, please. Um, oh, I have, um, I have my website, criticalnettheory.com. Ooh. So let me just share that screen with you. 
Uh, I can I can add that in and post if you want. Oh, to okay. Go. Just read. Yeah. It. Okay. So the A and C um, says uh, that medical faculty should role model how knowledge of intersectionality informs clinical decision making and practice. Faculty should teach how systems of power, privilege, and oppression inform policies and practices, and how to engage with systems to disrupt oppressive practices. Students should describe the impact of various systems of oppression of health and healthcare, e.g., colonization, white supremacy, acculturation, and assimilation. <laughs> That's from the Amer Association of American Medical Colleges, and these are what all medical schools would be required to teach all medical students. Um, this uh, is closely related to a different document called Organizational Strategic Plan to embed racial justice and advance health equity from the American Medical Association. I quote from page 38, we must adopt collaborative and participatory approaches and ensure that we use the theories, uh, bracket intersectionality, critical race theory, et cetera, tools and approaches that allows us to consistently identify, elevate and work with marginalized groups in any spaces. Page 42, our methods will be informed by social epidemiology and critical race theory, recognizing the deep-rooted structural and social drivers of health. What's social epidemiology? epidemiology? I don't know. Do you know what epidemiology is? That's like the same. Well, of diseases, I know right? what epidemiology is. Epidemiology. What the heck is social epidemiology? Yeah. I will have to ask an Whatever expert. They say. Yeah, right. No, no, you should pay them for their labor of uh, educating you. Oh, yeah, of course. To educate yourself. So mm -hmm. what's your argument against this stuff? Why does it bother you or why do you think it's faulty? I hear a bunch of buzzwords and I can make uh -huh. arguments too, but I want to know your process. I, I, as James Lindsay says, let's look at the fruit from the tree. All right. So uh, on June 3rd, 2021, Katie Herzog published uh, in, an article called What Happens When Doctors Can't Tell the Truth. I'm just going to read from that, and, and we can talk about this behavior. Last year at Harvard Medical School, a seasoned psychiatrist interviewed an elderly white patient about his battle with substance abuse on Zoom. The patient talked about shame. He felt so much guilt over his drinking and his past behavior, he said, he said, the only person he could have ever confided in was, uh, in his words, an Eskimo in Alaska who didn't speak English. And even then, he would have to slit his throat. It was the sort of thing that healthcare workers occasionally hear. Historically, the guideline in a situation like that would be to ignore it. They were there to discuss addiction, not the patient's insensitivity. But a Native American student named Victor Anthony Lopez Carmen, observing the session on Zoom, was disturbed. He wrote about it later in Teen Vogue. His words sparked an immediate visceral reaction. This is um, Lopez Carmen describing his reaction to uh, the patient's words. He said uh, his words sparked an immediate visceral reaction. I felt my blood pressure rise and anxiety overtake my mind and body. My next reaction was to look at how the rest of my classmates were responding. The blank remote expression on some of their faces and the silence that followed remains burned into my psyche, end quote. <laughs> when neither the psychiatrist nor any of his fellow students paused in the moment to educate the elderly man, who was a patient, mind you, about his violent and racist language, as Lopez Carmen described it, he complained to the school. Um, in response, the school organized a session for faculty and students on Lopez Carmen writes, quote, confronting anti-Indigenous racism in the field of medicine. Should clinicians police patients' language to protect the feelings of their healthcare providers? Okay, so this is, this is um, a published story. Um, it is uh, Katie, Katie Herzog did the reporting on that. But there are a few other uh, vignettes from uh, my personal uh, colleagues, like my personal contacts, um, I'm not going to name who they are, but they were direct witnesses to the following incidents uh, in 2020 in the wake of a George Floyd in the wake of the George Floyd murder. A medical student in Washington asked seven deans from their medical school 
to chant the sentence, quote, I am a racist, end quote, repeatedly during a large public meeting. The deans, all seven of them, did so as told. At a large psychiatry residency program in Connecticut, white male attendings have reported that they are afraid to ask interns and residents of color to see inpatients that, while psychotic, have said racist words but are not otherwise threatening or physically violent. In Oklahoma, medical students and residents have quit patient care in the middle of a shift when they perceived microaggressions from patients. They just walked out on a shift I mean, this is patient abandonment, which is a most egregious form of unprofessionalism mm. in medicine. It is, it is considered absolutely taboo. And uh, critical race theory uh, related behavior um, is making this a uh, normalized this kind of behavior. It is absolutely against medical ethics to do this. Uh, and institutions, I doubt, are adequately disciplining this kind of behavior. Well, here's the thing. This is an interesting kind of uh, uh-huh. wave framework. Professionalism. Uh-huh. What is professionalism? What is it about these professional organizations now promoting unprofessional behavior? Why in the world would professional organizations enable unprofessional behavior? How does that not leach their authority? and corrupt the uh, the industry that mm-hmm. they're presiding over. And they're centering. I mean, they, they keep on talking about whose voice they're centering, right? Like they're centering student doctor Carmen Lopez over the patient. The patient has to be the center of a patient encounter. It's not about the medical student or the doctor. Um, and for them to like draw the limelight to himself rather than talk to pay attention to what the patient's experience is, is, is atrocious. Mm. Hmm. You know, there's, um, this is heated rhetoric, but there's anecdotes going around about how uh-huh. difficult it is for white males to get a job. Like a lot uh-huh. of the resumes are just kind of uh-huh. tossed out because of these diversity quotas, if that's happening with, um, men who are entering the Uh the work field and Uh making it difficult for them. And, you know, I think it's, it's not the end of the world because they they should be able to adapt and and figure out other things to do, you know, but it's still discrimination. It's still Uh bad. It's discrimination. But Uh if that is, if they're also going to be discriminated against in medical care, when they're seeking medical care and what the heck is a microaggression, that's just the interpreters, uh, that's up to the interpreter uh-huh. to do. I mean, the, the discrimination in hiring is one thing. The discrimination in receiving medicine is even worse. But it, uh-huh. if you take that all together with a narrative that white men are the big baddies, then you do have wide scale uh, just discrimination. And uh-huh. I don't know how that works out over time, but I don't think it's going to be good. Mm-hmm. beyond being wrong i don't think it plays out well mm-hmm. uh, in the long run to have a demonized group like that absolutely so when you see this what is your argument and what you you produce something for your field um to point to this and and to are you against this and what did you argue and how has the feedback been uh, well, I um, I laid out some of the uh, comparing and contrast of these values with um, what has been traditionally accepted as medical ethic uh, on my website, okay. which is crit- criticalmedtheory.com. Okay. Um, so, so you basic on, on an ethic. So you're seeing these two ethics. And yeah. And they're incompatible. That's... They're incompatible. Okay. Um Traditionally, medical ethics requires that if you are, say, a, a, a wartime surgeon, you treat the patient who was just shooting at you 10 minutes ago, and maybe he, he got shot, and, and you treat him the same as anybody else, right? Like, because the, the patient is your reason of being, and this reversal of uh, taking like centering, say, a 
doctor of color over a white male patient is uh, is incompatible with what we traditionally have accepted as uh, medical ethics. Mm -hmm. And do you see that not only being promoted by the centering of this Lopez guy, but also in the doctrine that's being taught in the DEI stuff, this... Um, not even, not, it's one thing for them to try to reform the medical industry, but it's another yeah. thing for them to use the medical industry to uh, reform the patient. And it seems like, is there a direct, is there like not a line that they're drawing there? Are they facilitating that line being uh, taken yeah, on? I um, am lucky enough that uh, the institution I work at is not very woke. So I don't have firsthand witness um, to to talk about, um, mm-hmm. but I definitely have colleagues who, because because where I work is not considered a hub of academic activity. It is a com- it, it is still um, more of a community hospital. Um, but some of my colleagues do work in uh, bigger academic centers, um, so. That's where I have mostly been hearing about these types of incidents. Um, yeah. So it's mostly at the schools. Yeah. One wonders to what degree it's going to be implemented within uh, hospitals because schools have, I mean, hospitals got a different liability structure going on, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. once uh, this. I could see a case happening where somebody's not treated or treated poorly because of their race and the amount of damage that that would possibly do to a hospital might incentivize hospitals themselves not to, not to enable the Mm -hmm. behavior that the students Mm -hmm. just were taught Mm -hmm. when they were in medical school. So they're going to have to do some deprogramming and then I'm sure the hospitals will eventually, if it, if the long march of the institution does stop where the mub- rubber meets the road, then the hospitals are going to have to kind of bully or pressure the schools to stop doing this stuff. Do you see that? Well, well, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I think it's, uh, again, they're trying to institute cultural change and in my opinion, for the worse. So if there is a critical mass of young and new doctors who come out thinking like this, um, then, then they, and hospitals are, are highly bureaucratic and getting more so. And we know that critical race theory infects um, bureaucratic institutions. Like bureaucracy is how they get in. Um, so yeah, I definitely have a lot of concerns about what's coming down in the pipeline when, um, when there is this kind of negative cultural change among physicians. Mm-hmm. Have you received any feedback from what you've been putting out there on this? Any any people coming out and telling you their stories? And, um, I'm hoping that this would help, um, the, this podcast. Yeah. Um, We're spreading your word. I mean, yeah, right now I just, I have, I mean, I, I work full time. I have mm. a, f- a family. It, um, I'm committed to speaking out. And I think that we need to have the courage to speak out, but uh, I don't have that much time to do self promotion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wrote the website criticalmedtheory.com um, with a physician audience in mind um, because the, the the format is is I mean the idea is that they can get through the whole five pages, five domains relatively quickly, and mm. what I really want them to focus on are the discussion questions at the end, and then really comparing and contrasting the value system of uh, the medical ethics that we have accepted for hundreds of maybe decades or hundreds of years and compare that with this different value system. I mean, one of them is uh, from the Belmont report, for example, that centers the individual as, uh, as sovereign and that as a patient, you treat the individual and I contrast that with the focus on collectivism um, from critical race theory. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know what? It's almost like they've diagnosed racism as a disease, but they did it not through, you know, like a DSM-5, you know, or some sort of like the actual medical textbook, because 
I guess it's just a prognosis. There's no way to fix racism, I guess, other than doing all these struggle sessions. So they, But they went through the bureaucratic apparatus rather than the textbook apparatus. It's just interesting that they're basically acting like doctors of, of the soul in a way. Well, to... Ibram Kendi was invited to all of these medical professional um, meetings. He was at the AMA, uh, American Medical Association, oh, and the American being, Pediatrics. American when you're being Academy. paid like $700,000 to show up, it's not really an invitation. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I mean, he just he goes to the American College of Surgeons and the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, the American Association of Medical Colleges. He has attended at least all of those. He might have gone to like the orthopedics and the and the um, the um, ACOG gynecology annual meetings as well. He gets yeah. paid an obscene amount of money to speak at those, um, and he doesn't get any challenges. I just he doesn't he doesn't come across as intelligent to me and that he, he confessed is, it in his book that he had a, a 1100 sub 1100 sat score in the, how to be an anti-racist he, he talked about that well yeah but that was racism i'm just talking about oh. his verbal ability <laughs> oh. right maybe that's racist too maybe it's racism maybe he's very smart it's just my racism or his racism mm. or racism itself that he's just not a good communicator i don't know i don't understand how oh, he, he, is, he writes so. in this this like circular style that says to love racism is to love capitalism to love capitalism is to love racism i'm like you just repeat it yourself and it's like the the remedy to to discrimination uh in the past is to discriminate in the future the the way to prevent present discrimination is to I mean, he just like he repeats himself over and over in this circular, circular style. I don't understand why he's so enshrined by these so-called professional organizations. It just, it is baffling to me. He's like the prophet that we deserve. Yeah. His fashion sense is pretty good. Okay. He he has a nice, uh, nice Spelt. suit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll I'll take your word for it. Well, it was very uh, wonderful to speak with you. Thanks for joining. Thank me. you. Oh, Thank you. I appreciate. Yeah. Appreciate being here.